Hello everyone, this is Dr. Young, and in this video we're going to talk about the tertiary and quaternary structure, right? So in previous videos we talked about primary and secondary, now we're talking about the tertiary and quaternary, which are kind of the higher level um, views of what a protein looks like, what explains its structure. And again, I've shown you this uh, picture before, right? Com protein structures get really complicated. We have all these loops and ribbons, um, all of these uh, beta sheets and everything. And so the question is, what makes up a protein, right? And we've already talked about how uh, one level of protein structure is just the primary structure, where that's the amino acid sequence, right? That's where you start with the N-terminus, and you just say in order what amino acids there are. Is it is it lysine, glutamine, alanine, alanine, isoleucine, histidine, arginine, uh, glutamic acid, whatever it is, in order till you get to the C-terminus. Now, the secondary structure, right, which we talked about in the other video was, that was all this, what's going on with these alpha helices and beta pleated sheets and stuff like that, right? So, like, here's a beta pleated sheet, here's a beta pleated sheet, here's one. And then versus the alpha helices, which this one has a lot of alpha helices, right? Here's an alpha helix, here's an alpha helix, here's one over here. There's a whole bunch of alpha helices in, in um, this particular protein. Now, but the question that we want to ask ourselves and that we want to answer here, right, is why are some of these near each other, right? So, like, why, for example, why is this alpha helix next to that one? Like, what's going on there? Why are those attracted to each other? Are they stuck there? Why did it fold this way? And so that's what the tertiary structure is all about, is how do the proteins fold in this way, right? If they're really one long chain, why is this chain, why is it all coiled up the way that it is? And then lastly, we'll, we're, gonna, we're about to talk about the quaternary structure, which is some a level of structure that some proteins, but not all of them have. Some proteins are made up of actually like more than one polypeptide chain, more than one one protein um, coming together to have some some larger function. So the tertiary structure, right? The tertiary structure here is all about the side chains, right? We're all about the side chains now. We're not talking about the backbone. We're not talking about the peptide bonds interacting. We're talking about side chains interacting. So right, remember that. Um, you know, if you look at your amino acid structure, so if you have your amino, your carboxyl, your H, and then whatever that R group was, that's what we're talking about is what's going on with that side chain, that R group, right? Is it going to hydrogen bond with other things or what, what is it going to do, right? So here's our side chain. So these are all solely about the interactions of your side chain. Um, we're going to take a look first at kind of the hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions of those side chains when they're in water, right? Since you are mostly water, they're in a pretty aqueous environment. And then we're also going to take a look at the interactions between side chains to form things like ion-ion um, attractive forces or hydrogen bonding or these uh, covalent disulfide bonds. So we'll take a look at those too. Now, so here's a drawing of a protein. This is insulin. And if you take a look at insulin here, I just want to orient you to make sure that you're kind of um, looking at this the same way that I am. All of these um, gray parts, all of those gray bends and everything, those are supposed to be carbon atoms. So those are all carbon, all of these gray, these gray spots right here. If you look at all of the um, red pieces, those are all oxygen. So all of these red things that I'm pointing to, in these cases, they're both carbonyls, but that would be oxygen atoms. If I look at the blue things... The blue things, you're going to see them mostly in the backbone here. Those would be the nitrogens, for example, in like the peptide bonds. So those are nitrogen atoms. So we're talking about nitrogen here. And then lastly, the yellows are sulfurs. So not a lot of sulfur here, but you do see some, for example, right here. So those would be sulfur atoms. Um, hydrogens are not shown here. I'll add some in as I, as I need, but we're not going to see a lot of hydrogens. The hy hydrogens are just simply not drawn for these types of structures. Just too complicated. Um, and so when I'm talking about these proteins being an aqueous environment, right, we just want to remember that there's a whole bunch of water molecules all over the place. And we want to ask ourselves, how will these side chains interact with these water molecules, right? So I'm going to draw a couple of water molecules here. So I'll, I'll draw one up here, one down here. Right, you just, I just want to make sure you have the impression that these proteins right, are completely surrounded by water basically at all times. And we also remember right, that water is a polar molecule, so I'll go ahead and I'll put some dipoles on a couple of these. And like we've said in previous videos, um, water molecules, right, they help solubilize, or in other words, they're attracted to things that have charges, so like ions and like things that have polar bonds themselves. And so if you look at the protein, right, one of the ways, one of the reasons why it folds a certain way is because of what we call the hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions here, right? So if you take a close look, um, I'm going to highlight some of these. If you take a close look at like the um, 
the amino acids, the side chains that are on the outside of this protein. So like for example, over here, we have a carboxylic acid. The H isn't drawn here, but there's an H on this. So that has a partial negative, partial positive, partial negative. It's a pretty polar functional group. Same thing out here, there's, it's not shown, but there's an H on this, so that's a partial positive, partial negative, partial positive. Same thing uh, here, this is a bunch of nitrogens, so those are partially negative, partially positive, partially negative, uh, partial positive. Same thing over here, right? We have a whole bunch of polar groups, again, partial negative, partial positive, et cetera, partial negative. And I could go around and keep on circling these side chains where I have a whole bunch of polar functional groups, right? I, all of these, these side chains, you'll, you'll see on the outside, they tend to be pretty polar and therefore tend to be hydrophilic. So what we see is that um, we tend to find, we tend to find um, polar, yeah, polar, or in other words, so I'll put tend to find polar amino acids or in other words, these are the ones that are hydrophilic, right? Hydrophilic amino acids. We tend to find them on the outside of a protein, right? So that they're near water because water is attracted. So since they have those partial charges, they're going to be attracted to the partial charges on the water. So they tend to be near the water so that we lower the energy of the whole molecule and you get those nice attractions. You let those magnets get close to each other, right? You let those charges get close to each other. Now this is in contrast to, for example, the inside of a protein, right? If the inside of the protein isn't near water, it's kind of tucked away, it's hidden on the inside, you tend to not see things that are really attracted to water. You tend to see hydrophobic things, or in other words, nonpolar things. And sure enough, if I look at the inside of this protein, right, I see a whole bunch of things that look like leucines and valines. All of these things I'm circling in red, right? These are all side chains, all located on the inside, and you'll notice that they're just C and H. Right? These are just carbons and hydrogens here. I don't see any polar bonds. I don't see any nitrogens, no oxygens, nothing like that. And so what we tend to see with those here, right, all of these guys, these tend to be nonpolar. So they tend to be nonpolar, right? They're just carbons and hydrogens. They tend to be nonpolar. Or in other words, they're hydrophobic. So we tend to find hydrophobic amino acids on the inside. So we tend to see hydrophobic amino acids on the inside of a protein, right? Because it's trying to hide away from water. It's being tucked away. It's not being near water. Water is not interested in it, so it kind of gets forced onto the inside of the protein. And these are general trends, right? So if you generally look on what's on the outside of an amino or of a protein, they'll largely be hydrophilic amino acids because they're attracted to water. If you look at what's on the inside, on the interior of a protein, tends to be hydrophobic ones uh, because they're not attracted to water. Now, this is not to say that you never find a hydrophobic one on the outside. You absolutely can find hydrophobic ones on the outside of a protein. And it's also not to say that you cannot find an a hydrophilic one on the inside of a protein. You absolutely can. It's just generally speaking, you tend to find polar ones on the outside and you tend to find nonpolar ones on the inside. Um, so you'll see ratios, they're, they're always skewed to that. You, you're right, these are just, these are basic trends. But these trends do explain one way in which, or one rationale why proteins would fold the way that they do. They tend to fold so that the things that are attracted to water are on the outside near water. Now we also can look at what's going on with the side chains themselves here, right? So um, if I look at the actual side chains, here's just a, a cartoon sort of diagram. Let's just call this the N-terminus. Let's call this the C-terminus. Right, where this is supposed to be a whole bunch of amino acids connected to one another. And I just drew some, some side chains to show why you might get two things hanging out near each other, right? So why would one amino acid be hanging out near another one? Why would, for example, like I showed you in that one slide early on, why would one um, alpha helix be hanging out next to another alpha helix? Now, I didn't draw helices here, but um, um, the, the, the idea is still the same. So if I take a closer look at this first loop here, right, if I put partial charges on everything, right, I got partial negative O, partial positive hydrogen, partial positive carbon, partial negative O, partial positive carbon, partial positive hydrogen. I'm just putting the charges on there, right, because those are polar bonds. Here I have a, a serine and a, um, 
Oh, what is it called? It doesn't matter. Siri Nan is gonna it's escaping me. Doesn't matter. I'm gonna think about it in a second. I have two polar um, side chains hanging out next to each other, and you'll notice right that what I've drawn here is they they line up so that they get some attraction between the partially positive thing and the partially negative thing. And if you remember from um, previous lectures and everything, right, that interaction where you have a partial charge being attracted to another partial charge, right, we call that a dipole-dipole uh, attraction. You can have a dipole-dipole attraction. Or in other words, in this specific case, it's hydrogen bonding. And so you'll see that in your books and online and everything is that one way that, that side chains can interact in the tertiary structure is through hydrogen bonding, right? And so here would be an example of where you have these two different groups attracted to one another um, in a hydrogen bonding for, uh, form. So that'd be why two amino acid residues would be attracted to one another. So we got hydrogen bonding in one. This one is a little different over here in the middle where I have the two sulfurs, right? This interaction flat out is um, a covalent interaction, right? So we're looking at, at right here where the idea is that these two residues were, they used to be cysteine, where it used to be just an SH, and then this one was an SH. So you used to have these two cysteines that were not connected, and then they connect to make a covalent bond here to form what's called the disulfide bond. So here's an actual covalent bond. And this is, like I was saying before, is your disulfide bond, right? Disulfide. This would be your disulfide bond right here, right? Di meaning two, sulfide as referring to sulfur. And this is a way to kind of staple together two loops and make them not come apart. So when you have these disulfide bonds, they tend to connect, you're done. They're, there's an actual covalent bond. So it's not as weak as a hydrogen bond is, for example, where it's just two charges hanging out next to each other. This is an actual covalent bond. They're sharing electrons. Something had to come by and oxidize those two and make an actual uh, disulfide bond. And that's usually considered part of the tertiary structure also, is the disulfide bond. So that's another type of interaction that you can have between side chains, specifically between two cysteines. Now, the last major one here, right, is this interaction where you can have <coughs> um, your side chains that are ionized, right, because at normal, pH, normal physiological conditions, normal physiological pHs, carboxylic acids tend to lose their H's and um, amines tend to pick up H's. And so you have these ionized forms, and in this case, right, you have a negative hanging out next to a positive, which we've seen before, and we know that that's called an ion-ion attractive force, right? So here you have an ion-ion attraction, um, which you can call an ionic, an ionic attraction or an ion attraction, but you also sometimes hear this called a salt bridge, Sometimes they're called salt bridges just because salts are ionic compounds in water. So sometimes you hear this called a salt bridge. And this would be another type of interaction that would hold together different loops, different parts of one peptide chain near one another um, based solely on their side chains. All right. So again, the tertiary structure is all about what are these side chains doing? How do they interact with water or how are they interacting with themselves? So these are some of the elements of why a protein would fold the way that it does and why does it stay in the shape that it does. Right. And remember that the protein's shape is crucial to its function. Um, it needs to be in just the right shape in order to, to form the way that it does, perform the way that it does. Now, we also have the quaternary structure, which, um, like, I was, uh, like I've said before, only some proteins have this, right? So some proteins consist of multiple protein subunits, multiple uh, peptide chains. And the classic example here is hemoglobin, right? So if you take a look at hemoglobin, you can see um, that it looks like hemoglobin has these four different pieces. In, in this particular drawing that I got from Wikipedia, um, two are blue and two are red, but that's just because two are alpha subunits and two are beta subunits, which is not really what we care about. But the idea is that hemoglobin has four individual peptide chains, right? So these are four different peptides. Four different peptide chains. that are not held together covalently, right? The idea is that um, you would have four N-termini. So let me, let me write four there, sorry. Well, yeah, you, you just, it's just that you'd have four N-termini and four C-termini, right? This has four Ns. These are four different peptide chains, four different proteins, right? So you'll have four 
and termini and four C termini is the idea because every single one of them right would have their own beginning and end is the idea. Now this is in comparison to right something like hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is just right it's just one peptide. It's just one peptide chain which means it has no quaternary structure, no quaternary structure whatsoever, right? Because it's only one peptide chain, it has no quaternary structure, whereas hemoglobin does have a quaternary structure, namely that it has these four subunits. So hemoglobin does have a quaternary structure. And again, the quaternary structure just means that the protein that is having whatever function is actually made up of different subunits that are working together to um, have a higher function. So a hemoglobin tends to hold certain gases better than myoglobin does. Myoglobin is really good at holding oxygen, but hemoglobin's uh, much better at transferring oxygen and, and carbon dioxide back and forth is the idea. But let me show you. Uh, let me show you a video of hemoglobin now. Just it'll help you kind of get a better sense of these four subunits. I want you to see it. So here's another picture of um, hemoglobin, right? So here's a 3D structure of it, right? I can rotate this around. You can see it definitely has its 3D structure, but also I think this helps you see those four different subunits that we were talking about a little bit better, right? That previous uh, picture had them as two different colors, but here all four are shown as uh, separate peptides, separate subunits. So you can see, right, that this would be the quaternary structure of hemoglobin, right? It has four separate subunits, four separate peptide chains, right? You can actually isolate some of these and see that they have a beginning and an end on each of their own little peptides is the idea. So like this yellow one in front here, I'm trying to kind of highlight, you can see the end piece over in the upper right hand kind of part and the other end of the yellow piece in the middle there. So it's four separate chains and those are just held together by non-covalent um, interactions. So that's the difference, uh, right? Quat some, some proteins have quaternary structure, which means they have multiple subunits. Some proteins do not have a quaternary structure like myoglobin, that would just be one individual peptide chain. So that kind of summarizes protein structures, right? We talked about our primary structure, which we said is simply the, um, the actual uh, amino acid sequence here, right? So the primary structure itself is just that amino acid sequence. So they give some, I give some examples down here. This is from um, a, a, a website. Um, and the secondary structure we said was alpha helices and the beta, this is calling it beta strands, but we call it beta sheets or, alpha, or beta pleated sheets. So beta sheets. And then those beta sheets and alpha helices kind of fold up a certain way, right? And that's because of those hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions that we were talking about. And then lastly, the quaternary structure is where those um, subunits can kind of glom together to form a larger macromolecule. So here's an example, right? You can clearly see the three different colors are from three different peptides. That's one large protein with one large function, but it's made up of three smaller proteins. So that'd be its quaternary structure. So I hope they feel like you have a little better understanding of the difference between the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure of proteins. They're really complicated molecules. We're just scratching the surface, but those are the big ideas that I want you to know. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. Um, I hope that you feel a little more comfortable and happy studying. Do lots of practice and lots of worksheets. Take care.